Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 670. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today's June 29th, 2021. All right, it started like Tuesday afternoon. I get Facebook message posts from fans and viewers and people who like our show. Uh, you haven't posted yet. Are you going to post? And for the well-informed audience who watched episode 669, they knew that George was likely to take the week off from Anglican Unscripted and go to a conference when he was going to learn about catechesis within the church and something, a tool to help his church. And so we probably weren't going to record it all last week. I know the people who did not watch that episode because you sent me emails on Wednesday. Well, where's the show? Are you? Did you lose your equipment? Is the camera broken? Do you, do you need something? Can we help you? And so uh, you, you need to watch all the shows, especially if you, you see us come up missing one week. George took a break from Unscripted. He attended this conference for a, whole, a full week, and well, now we're back. And we got uh, lots of stories. Here's all the stories we're going to cover. Uh, let me bring this up. This is my, my show notes. And we're Unscripted, but we do have notes in what we're going to talk. Everything from Foley Beach all the way to the Episcopal uh, Church is on the wrong side of history. Episode 670. So it's going to be fun. It's going to be long. The only thing, only thing missing this week is Catherine Jefford Shorey. We got Kenneth Kieron. We got uh, <laughs> Episcopalians <laughs> behaving badly. We got it all, folks, this week. Money, sex, drugs, rock and roll. That's this episode of Anglican Unscripted. We're going to go good. Before we get too far, you as an audience can donate likes. You go to Facebook, you click on the thumbs up button. That gives us free advertising with Facebook. If you see us on YouTube, click the thumbs up button. That's free advertising there as well. And that allows the algorithms at you know said uh, social institutions, Facebook and YouTube, to say, hey, this is probably a pretty good show. We can promote it to other Christians, other Anglicans, and other fat, bald people. So... We hope that uh, uh, you will do that. Please go to the comment section, add comments, say, George, glad to have you back. You can put that in the comments as well. And if you're not subscribed to an episode, please subscribe. And if you don't want to see oversized white people talking about critical race theory, please click on the podcast. You find that in the show notes. You can listen to us in audible format. George, how was your week? Fantastic. I would even say life or ministry changing. Well worth the time and the investment very very busy week we i susan and I, my wife and i went to uh level one training for the catechesis of the good shepherd which is a uh, christian education technique it doesn't teach you content of the faith uh, you supply that from your own tradition if you will but rather the technique and how to using the methods of maria montessori and developmental psychology reach the child with the appropriate information at the appropriate age and I have to tell you, I hate to say it, but I have been doing it wrong for 25 years. I certainly did it wrong with my own children. But in my ministry as a priest, I've always enjoyed children's ministry, and I'm pretty good at it. I mean, small dogs and children like me. And But now I've got the tools and techniques to take this to the next level. And my hope long term is to start, start a... Uh, parochial school based not only do this after school weekend program of catechesis of the good shepherd but take it even further starting a parochial school and really accomplishing the impossible of having a parochial school an episcopal parochial school for working class community which is where i live it's exciting future out there i'm really really excited about this well, it's one of the things that's been lacking for at least half a century uh, in the church as a whole. The We need to bring up our children in the faith. And, you know, ever since the institution of public education and being able to send our kids away for half a day to have somebody else bring them up and the sciences and the English and the grammars and the and the math and then they come home and we halt them with their homework that, that that method has been it's okay but it needs to be supplemented and encouraged and brought to whole with a catechesis with an understanding of, the, of how the kingdom works in all this and how mm -hmm. that is 
the secular culture that you're, we're, we're releasing you into. And this is how we view secular culture in the lens of the kingdom. And that's one of the major things, you know, certainly the churches I've gone to over the last uh, uh, 30 years have lacked this as well. We did not have a great opportunity to bring uh, our three kids up in uh, a full catechesis environment, learning about how the kingdom works. And, how, you know, it, when we were young and going to ch church, you have a daycare, right? We, no, don't, we, we don't, don't want little Johnny jumping up and down on the pews. You know? oh. So, so it, it's 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 good to see the church say, okay, we dropped the ball in this. We need to really reestablish catechesis within the church. So uh, keep us updated on how it works with your church, George, and uh, let's hope others uh, soon find adoption. I know the ACNA has been really big on catechesis, and uh, uh, look, you know, they've reaped well in that as well. They just had their uh, annual meeting. Or not in what what they call it annual council a annual council and uh the report that you know uh the membership of the acna is still strong uh, despite COVID, so that's good they also had foley beach get up and give us state of the, the uh, church talk and we had reported right before our last episode uh or at, during our last episode ray sutton had uh taken a, a stance against critical race theory in his diocesan talk. And that's big news because for the longest time, the ACNA bishops have been kind of quiet about this. They've been put together a little work, working group on how to, how to deal with critical race theory and how to deal with uh, racial relationships and discrimination and the history of the church and the history of the West and put that all in one little package and how scripture addresses it. And whether or not critical race theory can be used as an analytical, analytical tool in all this. Ray Sutton was the first to say, no, it doesn't work. Scripture itself is sufficient in this. Foley Beach, during his uh, State of the Church uh, talk, said the same thing. Critical race theory, in large part, does not have a place in the teaching of the church. Cool. Whoa. All right. Well, thanks for listening. <laughs> Yeah. And this wasn't just a one-liner or two. No. This was a sustained argument, essentially saying that a ideology based on hatred has no place in the Christian worldview. It is anti-Christian. It doesn't build the church. It destroys the church. It divides people. It doesn't unite people in Christ. And so Foley Beach had a... He earns his pay. Uh, he, he, you, you guys have a good one at the top. He earns his pay gave a sustained, intelligent, and affirming argument uh, that basically slit the throat of the critical race theory practitioners. In See, a very uh, godly way. way. In a very godly my, way. My, my approach is to take a sledgehammer and crack your skull open. Now, Foley didn't do that. Uh, Foley took a stiletto. And slid. You didn't know that you bled to death right then and there. Why would that quick flick of the wrist? So we're being silly, but uh, I have a great deal of admiration for the statement Foley Beach has made, and it makes it quite clear. Uh, there's been a little back and forth. The Anglican Church in North America had a task force to address this issue, and it came to a conclusion, but they couldn't release their report, in my understanding, and I, this is not something that you'll see written on Anglican Inc. because I can't prove it is that nope they weren't agreed they weren't united and they wanted to come to a statement where everybody was on board and not have a minority report and not there yet and i think the bishops may be in the same place where 99 and 9 tenths are on board with foley beach and there'll be one or maybe two holdouts and they want to come to a, so that's why i don't think we've seen a statement from the house of bishops on crt but foley beach and ray sutton have really expressed the mind and the teaching charism of the church on this issue if you are a member of the clergy the acna and you are pushing this saying well we have the freedom to believe whatever we want yes you do but you don't have the freedom to teach this in the name of the church in fact you'll be teaching doctrine contrary to the church yeah well i mean every church has a book club if you want to read this in your book club great you know but please have discerning minds and you know when the New Testament says, do not be deceived. This is what this is about. 
<laughs> when <laughs> Jack Spong puts out a book and you read the you know read it that's what the do not be deceived verse is for right there you can read it discern it oh yeah this is oh ooh, ah bad so you know we get to this point now where uh we've watched the southern baptist convention you know basically implode over the last couple of weeks because of critical race theory uh you, you've taken out the great uh uh, Southern Baptist, uh, Methodists are dealing with, United Methodists are dealing with this. Um, every denomination at one point uh, is looking at, to, is this a, a good analytical tool for dealing with race? And it's nice to see that the leadership, as far as we can tell, at the ACNA says no. In our country, we see the U.S. Army and the, the, the military institutionalizing CRT teaching. Mm -hmm. And the top brass, uh, chief of the general staff, uh, chief of the uh, chief of staff of the army, General Miley, is an absolute loon on this point um, of pushing this. And you know they'll, they'll have their day in the sunshine, and then in two years or four years they'll be gone. But it's, it's so destructive. I mean, the army of all things was the institution in the United States that served to make colorblind the standard you rose because of merit in the army and now we have an army that you rise because of merit or gender or sexual preference mm -hmm. um that's or, the or end of our republic color. yeah uh, uh, it's so. the well it's the end of our republic if this thing triumphs yeah uh, well as far as the church is concerned every dozen years or so the church is faced with you know a moral dilemma we had this with the sex wars, you know, 12, 13, 14 years ago in the Gene Robinsons. What role will same-sex relationships have within the church? What role will uh, relationships, sexual relationships outside of marriage have uh, within the church, and can it be blessed? And the church largely rose up and said, here's our stance, here's where we're going to have our dividing line, and here is where, if you continue this, this will rip apart the communion. And now we have a fractured communion. Will CRT further fracture the communion? Now, CRT itself is pretty much just focused on the West. Largely America, you see a little bit going off here in Europe, and they're like, hey, that's not us. <laughs> no CRT here. But uh, it's, it's the French have pretty much come exactly, but the English are infected too. Yeah, the, the English are infected. The French are saying, this is stupid. <laughs> I'm not going to use a, a French swear word, sorry. Um, so, you know, this is fo focused solely here on America and its ills. And please hear George and I. Racism and slavery and discrimination are a horrid scar on our country. You know, we've seen it, we've watched it, we've learned through it history. We have moved beyond that. Yes, there's still problems in the world, but the problems are not solved by introducing another form of racism. The problem is fall, uh, solved by going to scripture, by going to God in this and letting the, the, the son, Jesus, be the bridge, be that bridge of reconciliation uh, between all men and between all women and between all mankind as he came to do and died doing so a little sermon from kevin we need to move on george <laughs> so uh anglican tv has been around since 2008 in that time no viewer has ever bequested money to us we get all our money the, the old-fashioned way. We, we beg through From PayPal. Kevin's wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> you know, the, the Carlson family checkbook, uh, the, oh, we need to go to Israel, please donate. Uh, nobody has ever uh, wrote us into their will. And I read with uh, uh, humor, uh, about, it's almost been a year uh, since this happened, but a Chicago priest received from a parishioner a uh, bequest of five hundred thousand uh, dollars that was last year and made the news i think we talked about it on the program here and i think i don't remember the, the latest update in the story george will give it to us but she said yeah the bishop said give it back oh i'll give it back no big deal 
in this day and age, giving it back is not enough. A um, Episcopal priest, uh, a woman priest in uh, Diocese of Chicago, had a parishioner whom she cared for, the parishioner's husband, and the husband died, and she spent a great deal of time and pastoral support with this elderly woman. Uh, just as any good, normal priest would. You care for those in greatest need. Uh, you spend a lot of time with her. Well, when this woman died, she left a half million dollars to the priest. Well, the executor of the woman's estate was her nephew. She had no children. And the nephew said, I didn't know about this bequest ahead of time. And hey, this isn't fair. You, a caregiver shouldn't get this amount of money. Well, the Diocese of Chicago said, yes, we don't want our priests to be the recipients of bequests from our parishioners. And the bishop gave a pastoral directive to the priest to turn the money over to the family. And the priest had no problem with that. Well, the family decided, well, let's sue the priest anyway. And they're asking for a million four in damages and legal fees and the money back. And the priest is saying, wait, wait, wait. I'm happy to give you the 500000 back, but I'm not going to give you another $900,000 just because you want it. So it's in the civil courts in Chicago. The woman's not in any trouble with the Diocese of Chicago because she's done what she's been told to do. But I did not know this. In researching the story, in the state of Chicago, they have, uh, under their probate laws, a caregiver. Uh, state of Illinois, city of Chicago. Excuse me. Doctor. The state of mind of Chicago in yes. the state of Illinois. <laughs> excuse me. In Illinois, if a, in, under their probate law, this was came about in 2014, if a caregiver that includes clergy providing pastoral care uh, receive more than $20,000 in a bequest for someone of whom, for whom they've given care, then that is presumed to be a fraudulent or, or uh, the abuse of the elderly. So in essence, the most that you can leave your priest whom you love to death and who has slaved over you, or Anglican Inc. who loves you to death and has slaved over you, is 20,000 in Illinois. I don't know if this holds true in Indiana. <laughs> and it's pro I think it's probably a good idea because here in Florida, we see it time and again cases of of elder abuse where a, uh, a caregiver comes in, wraps the person around their finger, the children are up north somewhere, and yep. the uh, caregiver takes control, robs a woman blind, and there's nothing can be done. Illinois law is such that the most this caregiver can receive is 20000 The only way around it is if, if the transfer is made before death. You can do what you want with your own money, but then... Kevin, you told me that the tax consequences of that. Well, are, are the same. okay, this is Illinois. When you when you were bequested the five hundred thousand, I think the the uh, the rate on inherited money is forty three percent. That goes back to the state in Illinois. So either way, if you got it before or after, the tons, the the tax consequences are unattainable. Uh, you, you're not seeing a, half that money is you're never going to see. So Illinois is horrible for that type of tax situation. Um, they want your money whether you're alive or dead. <laughs> um, let's so, move on to... So if you're going into the ministry, don't look at this as a jackpot where you can milk no. your parishioners. <laughs> no. Because if you get caught, yeah. back the money goes. And it, let's be honest here. For those of you who want to set up a bequest for Anglican TV Ministries, uh, that's fine. Tell everybody else in your family that you're doing so. I don't want to fight afterwards. <laughs> I'm not giving back the the ten dollar check I'm getting. No, mm, no. And, and Alan Haley has retired from the practice of law, so That's we can't right. afford an attorney to fight for it. us. <laughs> All right. So um, we always. Obama was wonderful for this. He would fly around uh, to other countries on behalf of the American flag, and he would say, "Sorry." We're so sorry that America was so evil for so long, and we've just been a bad witness to uh, human secularization, and we are sorry for all the wars we've caused, uh, and all the atrocities we've brought, and the drone strikes, which I continue, we're sorry. And it's a sorry tour. Justin Welby did the, so uh, uh, the sorry tour. Michael Curry did the sorry tour. Canada is now doing 
well, at least one bishop in Canada, has started the sorry tour, George. Well, I would say that Canada is the Connie Francis of the Anglican Communion. Sorry. Connie Francis, of course, had that great hit, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. so sorry. So sorry. Please accept my apology. <laughs> They're always apologizing in Toronto for what other people have done. Be it their ancestors, be it other white people in other countries, this or that. And so the Bishop of Toronto, Andrew Asbill, on Monday of this week, released a, an apology. Kevin, do you have the title of it in front uh, of you? Yeah, let me put it up here for you. Uh, the Apology to Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgendered, Queer, Two-Spirit, Plus Community, in the Diocese of Toronto from Bishop Andrew Asbill. Now, does plus mean like fat, like a plus size store of fat people, or I don't, half of that stuff, what does two-spirit mean? And as a Trinitarian, I'm a three-spirit guy. I don't know, I don't. <laughs> but, you know, we're being silly, but the response to this, except from the true believers in the Diocese of Canada and across the Anglican Church of Canada, all 12 of them, is ridicule. Now, do you think that this has any impact on the relationship with the gay community in Toronto? Of course not. The Anglican Church of Canada has, in Toronto has been participants in pride parades from day one. Uh, it's, it's ridiculous uh, because and it, as an apology, it means nothing because they're not apologizing for anything they have done. The Andrew Asbell, the Bishop of Toronto, from the beginning has been carrying the water for the gay lobby and the gay movement, and he's very happy to apologize for the sins of other people. And theologically, what this is saying is, it's like the Pharisee saying, Lord, thank God I'm not like other people. And when you apologize like that, and Justin Welby did this in India, and Michael Curry did this in, uh, I think it was in Ghana, you're basically uh, what's the point well no that th this is a great example of what's the point uh we can go way back uh, bishop spong wrote a book why christianity must change or die in canada in the anglican church in canada it changed and it died it did everything <laughs> spong demanded the church do the Christianity do they, they they took every chapter yeah we'll do that we gotta do that <gasps> that's hard but we'll do it you know and so they go through the, the the Jack Spong book page by page and they adopt it wholeheartedly and the church has died it has died so much that it makes an apology and it doesn't even make the news nobody's listening anymore you're no Except different than the poor culture <laughs> you know it's just like <sighs> so you know Live and learn. Hopefully, we, uh, hopefully, Spong has no, stopped writing books. But they're dying and not learning, Kevin. No. They're dying and not learning. That's Friends, right. I hope you live and learn, as Kevin said. Yeah, that's right. Uh, okay. Um, update from England. I, we're, we've just hit story six, so we're, we're moving along here. Update from England. Um, Robin Weeks is on sick leave. This is the continued story, George, uh, what's been happening. So, bring us a quick update. Well, the Jonathan Fletcher saga, of course, we've covered extensively over the past year or so. Mm -hmm. And one of the reports, uh, one of the report put out by uh, 318 or 318, um, excuse me, I've just mangled that in my head. <laughs> it's fine. Hey, but, yeah. That's the, the group that did the study on abuse, cult, abuse and the culture of abuse in the Emanuel Church called for heads to roll. And Kevin and I were very skeptical that heads would roll. Uh, nobody of any prominence. They get rid of a janitor here, there, or a tea lady, uh, but nobody of importance. Well, Robin Weeks, the uh, minister, the head priest at Emmanuel Church in Wimbledon, has announced that he's taking sick leave for an unspecified amount of time. Uh, he may genuinely well be sick. I don't oh, know, sure. but, but the code is that he's on terminal leave unless he looks for another job. Um, so a head may have rolled, but it's been ro but it's been done in a way so as not to embarrass Robert Weeks. He was brought, he was criticized in this report, I would say indirectly and by implication. But uh, we now see some we now see action taking place. Um, just as William Taylor 
has not taken sick leave over at St. Helens Bishop Gate. He's been hitting back with uh, a rather odd, we, we've discussed this, but rather unsavory defense that I was molested too, therefore I'm immune from criticism on this issue. Um, this, this Fletcher thing is just rolling on and on and on. And I think eventually it'll take down Justin Welby in one way or another. Or he won't come back from sabbatical. We'll see. You know, you, you, you don't know. Um, we reported on Anglican.inc about an acid attack in the Greek Orthodox Church, um, which is sad because I thought all the crazies were here in the West. But uh, George, why don't you bring us up to speed on that story while I find the image for that? Well, when you go to General Convention of the Episcopal Church, you meet a really you meet strange people, I gotta say. You meet angry people, mm -hmm. you meet strange people, you meet people that you would rather not have anything to do with. Well, we're not alone in this. There's a Greek Orthodox priest who got arrested for drug trafficking. He was part of a drug trafficking ring. I don't know what role he played. And of course, he was brought before a church tribunal. And at the church tribunal, he saw things were going against his way, and he, out of his briefcase, he took out two bottles of sulfuric acid, took the tops off, and yelling at the uh, tribunal, the panel of judges with the lawyers, threw acid in their faces. Seven bishops were uh, injured by the sulfuric acid, and one may be blinded. Uh, he was in an ophthalmolic, ophthalmological hospital for treatment. Mm -hmm. Uh, two lawyers were injured, and the policeman who wrestled him down and captured him was injured in by th the throwing of the acid. Um, it's, what can one say? that uh, Just a horrible thing to have happened. Um, and the, uh, the Greek government has stepped in and offered to provide, kick, to offer the medical care for the bishops and but it's just a national tragedy in Greece. Of a, and I don't even know if this priest is crazy. I mean, we have to, you know, it, the, the immediate thing is to say, well, is he crazy or was he evil? Um, I don't know the fellow, so I can't answer that. But evil does exist and people do evil things. Absolutely. And they're not crazy when they do no, it. No, absolutely not. Uh, so we, that, have a wicked, we have a wicked priest here in the Greek church. Yeah. And so keep these people in your prayers because uh, acid burns and recovering from uh, acid trauma is not something the skin was designed to do. And we could certainly use uh, some prayers for these priests. Uh, topic for at least the last since January 20th is should the Catholic Church allow President Biden and his dear wife Jill to take or receive communion? And this has been a topic that's been going back and forth, certainly in the press, in the Christian press. We even posted a wonderful story here by uh, Gavin Ashton on Anglican Inc. Uh, discussing this. And if he were Episcopalian, it's not, it's, there's a no-brainer. Uh, so what, somebody asked us on one of our Facebook forums, uh, you know, what would the Episcopal Church do? What would the Anglican Church do? And George had an easy answer. What would they do? Well. Before we go into what uh, we would do, mm -hmm. let's just update things. The sure. U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops is wrestling, has been wrestling with this issue uh, whether, where Joe Biden, who proclaims himself to be a practicing, professing Roman Catholic who goes to church, receives, mat, receives communion, he's one of the team, whether he should be denied communion because he... Uh, is an unrepentant supporter of abortion on demand at any time, any place, anywhere. And this stance is at odds with the Catholic teaching, directly at odds. And what, and it's not because he's committing a thought crime, but rather he's acting upon this. He's promoting it by having government money spent to provide abortions. Military bases now may now provide, I mean, it, it's just. Obama, uh, Biden is in the pocket of Planned Parenthood on this issue. And in the Roman Catholic Church, there, the argument is that the elements themselves are the body and blood of Christ, independent of the thoughts and actions and faith of the, of the receiver, the recipient. Um, and can Biden be allowed to take the body and blood of Christ? And it looks like the Roman Catholic Church will first privately tell him, you can't, 
don't come to church because you'll be repelled from communion. Now, some bishops don't agree with this, and in fact, the bishop, Archbishop of Washington, Cardinal Gregory, Wil Gregory Cardinal Wilton, I believe, will has said that he's opposed to this because this is politi politicizing the Eucharist. Well, Gavin Ashenden makes the point in his article that's actually the other way around, that Biden is bringing politics into the life of the church. The church is not interfering in the life of politicians. Biden has been a uh, pro supporter of abortion for decades. Nancy Pelosi is a supporter of decades. Of, and they're Roman Catholics and they make a great noise about it. But Biden is now in a position to impose teachings at odds with the Catholic Church. So it looks like Biden will not be allowed. For the Anglican and Episcopal way, theologically speaking, no, we would allow, we would welcome him. Oh, absolutely. Even if you think... Now, people would say, well, that's awful, that's terrible. But it's because we have a different Eucharistic theology. If you look at the Articles of Religion, that lays out the basic outlines. There are some Anglo-Catholics who hold a Roman Catholic position, but the uh, position outlined in the Articles is that the elements do not have a spiritual value for the non-believer. Those who eat and drink uh, without belief achieve nothing. So okay. that the, there's no theological issue. And second, we don't repel people for bad thoughts. We repel them for bad action. Jesus. This is why Trump, this is why Trump <laughs> yeah. was never repelled from Bethesda by the City Episcopal Church right. when he would worship there with his family or St. John's Lafayette Square. Both very liberal Episcopal churches but they would never repel the president of the United States over differences of opinion and thought because we don't see the Eucharist in the same light in that manner. Jesus did not repel Judas. So in that light, you know, I, I see, you know, having Biden at, at, at the table is, you know, now, there was a, a, an op-ed in the Washington Post by an Episcopal priest sounding off, I'm an Episcopal priest, and the, uh, I think the title was, I'm an Episcopal priest, repelling Biden from the community would be the nuclear option. The problem is, he's writing from an Episcopal perspective. That's right. And it was very unwise for him to involve himself like that. Uh, if, from an Episcopal perspective, yeah, he's right. But the Episcopal spec perspective is not the Catholic perspective. And we just can't allow those political differences uh, to overcome what we understand takes place at the altar, at the yeah. table. So, interesting topic, and uh, certainly we'll be talking about it for in, until he's either Article 25 in a couple weeks or makes it uh, through his complete term. We'll see what happens. Uh, let's see here. Ooh. George, next story, story 9 of 11, Kenneth Kiernan is back in the news. Uh, For those with long memories of Anglican Inc., what our second favorite person after Catherine Jefford Shorey is Kenneth Kieran, the uh, former S General Secretary of the Anglican Consultative Council. Good old Ken, a uh, few years back, l res resigned to become Bishop of Limerick in the southeast, southwest of Ireland. Now that's a tiny, geographically it's a big diocese, but it's tiny. They only have nine stipendary or paid clergy. The Anglican Church in Southwest Ireland is in tough shape, both from emigration and from a lack of evangelism. Church of Ireland in the north, Belfast, Ulster, is doing pretty well. In the southwest, it's dreadful. Well. We reported on Anglican Inc., the uh, Standing Committee statement of the Church of Ireland on the abortion laws in Ulster. The British Parliament imposed abortion laws on Northern Ireland, and the agreement was that Northern Ireland should make its own abortion laws. But Northern Ireland wouldn't allow abortion, and so the British government forced it on them. And the Irish General Synod, uh, the Standing Committee of the Church of Ireland issued a statement saying, here's what we believe on abortion. And we, that, you know, you shouldn't have done this, that it was wrong and we aren't at one with abortion. So on Anglican Inc., we said, hooray for the Church of Ireland, they're speaking out on abortion. 
Well, members of the Church of Ireland, including someone on the uh, on that standing committee of the Church of Ireland, wrote to us says, "No, you, yes, you reported what happened, but you missed the importance. There was a two clauses in this motion." The first clause, which has appeared, and the second clause, which says the Church of Ireland rejects abortion except in extreme cases where the life of the mother is at stake, and essentially gave a very traditional understanding of the evils of abortion. And Kenneth Kieran, as Bishop of Limerick, and Michael Burroughs, Bishop of Cashel and Ossery, uh, another southern diocese, were able to get the second clause removed. So the Church of Ireland's position on abortion actually has been liberalized because they did not repeat their current stand that abortion on demand is wrong and that it can only be in extraordinary and extreme cases. So good old Kenneth Garon retires in October as Bishop of Limerick. So they'll only have, uh, they won't have nine people to pay in that diocese anymore. They're just back to eight clergy. <sighs> but man, he's the gift that kept giving. I mean, here in his swan song, he uh, stands up, he, he hands one to the abortion activists in the church in Ireland. Uh, and bit by, this is, how, this is how doctrine changes. You don't see it all in one day, but bit by bit, they remove clause six, clause five, clause four, clause three. Yeah. So all you have at the end of the t end of it is, oh, this is a this makes us sad, but you don't have any of the doctrine or theology or statements as to what to do and how to do it and why to do it. So hooray for <laughs> Kenneth Kieran from a press reporter's perspective. There are and there's so many Anglican TV Kenneth Kiernan stories. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. We could do just an episode. <laughs> oh, can I, Kevin? Can can would you tell the one about Saint Vladimir's Seminary in New oh, York? Oh, yeah, geez, uh, great friends I have at Saint Vlad's, including the leadership there. And back in the early days of Anglican TV, um, we were known for our live streaming. You, you call Anglican TV, your service is being live streamed. They will show up. He, Kevin will have a laptop or two. He'll bring his camera, his audio equipment, and he will live stream your thing. So St. Vlad's was having a conference, and they invited the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, Roland Williams, uh, to lead this conference and do some teaching and uh, be in front of the cameras and give some good press to St. Vlad's. St. Vlad's is not an Anglican uh, seminary. It's a Orthodox seminary, uh, St. Vlad. And so uh, they called up and everything's uh, arranged top to bottom. People have called me uh, from St. Vlad's. You're, you're good to go. Come on down. There'll be a little stipend to help you out. Uh, you, you, you can show up on time. we got a hotel room. And uh, it went quiet for a day or two. They hadn't called. And I, I get a strange phone call <laughs> from, I, I don't want to reveal the person's name, but a person in the upper echelon of St. Vlad's leadership called and said, Kevin, I just had the strangest phone call <laughs> from a certain person named Kenneth Kiernan at Lambeth Palace said, if I'm there as an Anglican TV, Roland Williams won't be there. <laughs> so, so we have a really important choice to make. And, and in my funny way, I said, well, that's, that sucks for Roland. I'll be there. <laughs> but uh, they, they did choose Roland over me. And, oh, you know, that's my. just, that was the early days of uh, Lambeth Palace and Church House and others trying to deal with this, this new entity c called social media or backpack media where a person can show up with a camera and live stream into the world where video does not lie, uh, where, you know, press reports can be slanted. But that video, unedited, that tells you what really happened. And uh, they didn't want that. Uh, that is something, even under the uh, auspices of the leadership of Rowan Williams, uh, not going to happen. Kenneth Kieran, as Kenneth Kieran, as ACC General Secretary, was the one who, who pr promulgated the theological position of that was then, this is now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as a reason <laughs> to change things. Okay, well, we're up here to 40 minutes, so let, let's close out the last two stories. Um, People at the end of the day, I, I, even President Trump has finally said, well, we didn't get enough votes to win. He's he's pretty much, all these investigations have been done in Michigan and Arizona and all that. Um, and he was asked in a recent interview, 
Um, did you win? No, I didn't have enough votes to win. Okay, so, you know, why did Trump lose? And in my mind, I think a lot of people uh, in the middle, that, that soft middle that he needed, didn't like the fact that he was what we call a mean tweeter. Okay, because <laughs> you would wake up in the morning and the New York Times, Washington Post, and every other periodical uh, throughout the nation would list his tweets that he got up at 4 a.m. in the morning to tweet about and what he was upset about. Now, a large majority of his uh, followers loved his tweets. It, it was the president communicating to the people. Uh, there, there's no middleman. He, you got to see exactly what he thought uh, and what he thought about. And so uh, it's been surmised that he, he, he lost the election because he was uh, an okay president but a mean tweeter. And the tweets reveal the heart. And that's, that, that's what happened to Trump. We have a mean tweeter bishop over in England, uh, and she got in trouble, so much so that Justin Welby was disappointed in her tweets. And now she's, she's actually, on medical leave. She's actually in Wales, not oh, does, England. And it's all the same. Uh, We're Westerners. We are from America. We, you, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, they're all from England. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry, people. So, yes, it is from uh, Wales. <laughs> for those who enjoy picking nits and lies, this is yeah. that's the one that you can pick on today. Yeah, Joanna Penberthy is the Bishop of Saint David's on the west coast of uh, Wales, and she's a prolific tweeter. She's had forty thousand tweets over just a few years. Um, just an extraordinary and the vast majority are sort of political stream of conscious thought. And she had a tweet saying, never, 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 never trust the Tories, the Conservative Party. And this was back in March. Well, a Conservative government minister noticed this and complained uh, earlier this month in June. And we reported that uh, she was forced to uh, back down and apologize because the diocese that she superse uh, 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 supervises is has conservative members of parliament so basically she's uh, alienating the people where she lives she's basically saying you have to believe in one political theory to be good at to be an anglican all this and that well the story continues the bish archbishop of wales had retired and the senior bishop in the church of wales apologized on behalf of the church of wales saying we don't really do politics and this was not the wisest move and the bishop took down her twitter account then the the minister for wales the government official the government uh, minister in the cabinet the uh, head of the welsh office complained to justin welby and welby did an extraordinary thing he apologized for bishop joanna penberthy's actions and words and then said he was embarrassed now why is this extraordinary this is the church in wales not the church of england He's not he's in charge of the Church of Wales. He's, not in, he, he's doing mm -hmm. what we talked about at the very beginning. He's apologizing for other people's behavior. Mm -hmm. Now, this was really unexpected. Um, I mean, all it would have taken would be a letter from an assistant. Thank you for your note. Uh, we're, we have no jurisdiction over this uh, bishop in St. David's. You need to address your correspondence to this person. They, well, we didn't do that. Well, we... And he's on, he's on sabbatical. Welby chose to hit this woman hard and say he was embarrassed by her actions and this and that. And then she's then, then the archdeacons in the diocese sent out a uh, letter to the clergy, which a member of the clergy sent to us, and we were the first to report this, that their bishop under doctor's orders was going to take the month of July off as sick leave, which again could be a signal that she's trying to weigh up whether she has the ability to survive this mm. but here's what well, the extraordinary thing is yes it was a foolish woman who did foolish things and said things that you know here's the danger of twitter people will really know what you're like but what's well be up to and in interfering in the church in wales and that's yeah. what to me is that's the big story what is he what is on his mind is he 
let's just walk to, I'm just thinking this out out loud. We've got the living in love and faith, the, the how we're going to deal with the gay stuff. We have general uh, percolating. We have general synod coming up. We have the Bishop of Liverpool, uh, Paul Bays. Uh, this past weekend spoke for a gay audience saying the Church of England should legalize and regularize same-sex marriage, make it gender neutral. And Welby strikes by hitting a Welsh bishop for a political mistake. So what does that tell me? It tells me that Welby has basically decided to roll over to the left in the Church of England and he's placating the right in the newspapers and the sort of the man in the pew by hitting uh, essentially a defenseless dumb bishop in Wales. I don't think it's a good sign for the direction of the Church of England. Again, I'm speculating. There's no... We're just inferring from the inference of what we saw happen. Which... But it's just so unusual for him to say any... Uh, Again and again, Welby has been asked like, what do you think... What do you think about the Bill Love situation? Well, I can't comment um, because that's it's, enough. It's, yeah, you know, come yeah. on now. I mean, he, he won't say a word. He didn't say word one about Bill Love. Hmm. Uh, but he's happy to take the hammer and dis- demolish this woman. Hmm. hmm. Well, yeah. Well, here's the sad thing, George. Most of us our inference reportings or what we think this means usually turn out to be true so oh well we'll see what happens here so final story and i tried to look it up how many decisions of the u.s supreme court have been unanimous since the founding of our country in 1776 and the I can't get into the first Google search. I'm going to have to do more uh, looking to find out how many. But I'm going to say it's not 10,000. It's not 1,000. It's not 100. Maybe 10 or 20 unanimous decisions in the uh, history of the Supreme Court. And one came down certainly this year. In the Certainly in the modern era. Certainly yeah, and, in the and, modern era. Let's say post-World War II, certainly since then when the courts become more politicized right so it's, it's not normal it's not normal and it's abnormal this is <laughs> that's how unnormal it is because the court is very polarized on many issues um and i think it's kind of not designed to be that way but it's happened over time and uh, the media hasn't helped it social media has not helped it the presidents we have had have not helped it and so to have a unanimous decision by the supreme court on such a, a, a interesting issue as to whether or not a Roman Catholic uh, adoption agency or foster care agency can withhold services to those uh, of, of transgen- transgendered issues, lesbian, bisexual, are they allowed to do that? In, in the age of the gay cake, are they allowed uh, as a believing entity to have different rules than the state would have for its agencies or other private agencies and the supreme court unanimously said yeah they can have a a different set of filters for who they want to allow for adoption services and foster care services and and early childhood development services they do a lot so the supreme court you say yeah why why not it makes sense it made sense to every one of them on the supreme court (laughs) of course (laughs) you can uh, have a belief system that filters out uh, people based on sexuality the episcopal church love their soul god bless them decided that the Supreme Court unanimously was wrong and uh, the, the Episcopal Church is now on the wrong side of history in Kevin's opinion. Uh, what did Michael Curry uh, put out in his press release, George? Kevin, you're, I think you're absolutely right. And here, we're not so much interested in talking about the legals because we're not lawyers and people have been saying this is a victory, this is defeat, this and that. But in general, this when it's a nine to nothing, uh, against you, you know you're wrong. But the Episcopal Church, when we had uh, the uh, Supreme Court legalizing or mandating same-sex marriage in all 50 states, made a big deal about the Episcopal Church is on the right side of history. 
as shown by our supporting something that the Supreme Court has now said is a constitutional right. What do they say now when the Supreme Court, when the Episcopal Church had an amicus brief supporting the city of Philadelphia against Catholic Social Services, Catholic Social Services wanted to basically not be compelled to violate its conscience and place children in same-sex couples. It wasn't that Catholic Social Services was the only agency and therefore gay couples could not go elsewhere. There are plenty of adoption agencies, but forcing the Catholic one to be like the secular ones. And the U.S. Supreme Court said that violated freedom of religion and the Episcopal Church, Michael Curry said, this is wrong. And Michael Curry said it in such a dumb way. I have to say dumb way because he talked about gay rights and we support homosexuals and lesbians unequivocally and this and that. And that wasn't the issue. It was the freedom to exercise your conscience belief. Now in the post Bill Love era, that's not allowed in the Episcopal Church. And so what we now have is the Episcopal Church is not following the great arc of history. It's not follow it's not leading the way. It's the retrogressive, repressive, neo Stalinist a group think uh, is what the Episcopal Church supports. And so what do they now, next time they have some win in court, can they ever trot out again with the straight face being on the right side of history? I don't think they can, because they certainly are on the wrong side of history in the uh, Philadelphia case. Takes us right back, George, to that wonderful Spong book why Christianity must change or die. The Episcopal Church went page through page, said, yep, we're going to do this. Oh, let's check this. Let's highlight this one in yellow. We're going to do this one. And it changed to the Jack Spong world. And now, largely, certainly at the leadership level, uh, the Episcopal Church is dead. It has ceased. And Michael Curry's statement here is proof that uh, the Episcopal Church stands for no uh, discernible religious value at the leadership level. Oh, it's hard to say that as a former member of the Episcopal Church. Uh, George, I think that's our last story. We, we hit it out of the park with that one. Uh, anything else you need to talk about before? Well, we've got the Birmingham Church at the Cathedral of the Advent. I think we should wait till next well, next show to do that because that's a bigger story. That's a that's bigger story. We'll, we'll cover in, now that we said we got to cover. We got to cover it. Uh, we'll cover the, uh, the the covenant between the Diocese of Alabama and the uh, Birmingham Cathedral. That'll be an interesting story indeed. Oh, and and the Bishop of Manchester saying adultery. That's okay. That's okay. Oh, uh, we could do that next show. <laughs> Which, if I were his wife, I would say, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 690 of Anglican Unscripted.